Before beginning today, I would like to extend a special thanks to the Minnesota Festival and Events Association and the Minnesota Access Alliance. This webinar is part of a larger grant focusing on festival event accessibility and resources, and both organizations were instrumental in both the planning and implementation of events in relation to this project. This webinar is going to focus on the creation of an accessible and inclusive festival environment. In the first part of today's webinar, we're going to focus on the foundations of philosophy and practice when thinking about and talking about disability and accessibility. Then it will move to thinking about areas for consideration as you plan, design, and implement your event. And at the end of the webinar, there will be the provision of some resources and hopefully a little empowerment so that you can move forward with confidence as you begin to look at this across your event and across your organization. I always like to think about these types of trainings as thinking beyond the ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act. While we will be providing some links at the end with access to the measurements and standards of the ADA, I really want to encourage you to think of accessibility and inclusion as more of a philosophical approach and something that's woven more deeply into the fabric of your organization and your event and that you use the regulations from the ADA as a tool to help you achieve that overarching goal of creating welcome for all. Recognizing that everyone is coming to this webinar with diverse entry points and diverse levels of experience in relationship to both disability and accessibility. Please be assured that wherever you are starting from is exactly the right place to be starting from. This work is constantly a journey. It is not a destination. There are always ways that you can improve and always ways that you can uh, think about the next level and what can to do to improve upon what's been done the year before. So definitely really look at this as the beginning of a conversation and the beginning of a journey that will continue onward as your event continues to evolve. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to be used, using what is known as person-first language. This is a way of talking and speaking about the disability community that really shows dignity and respect. It focuses on placing the person first rather than a descriptor of their disability. So for example, rather than saying something like the Downs kid, you would say a child with Down syndrome or an individual who uses a wheelchair or a visitor who is blind or has low vision. I always suggest using person first language as a default when in customer service settings. It really is a very simple way to uh, show dignity and respect and welcome and inclusion. Obviously recognizing that language is a very personal choice. And just like individuals have very specific language that they want used to describe other identity markers, an individual with a disability might want to be referred to in relation to their disability in a different way. So always begin with person-first language, but of course, respect and listen. And if someone asks you to use different language choices, you would obviously default to that. To get started today, I would like to take a moment to briefly define the parameters of what we mean when we talk about disability. A lot of times when we're focusing particularly on a built environment and construction, we tend to focus on physical disability. But it's important to understand and remember that disability encompasses a wide range of types of disability, which includes physical, cognitive, learning, sensory disability, emotional, behavioral, developmental, all of that falls under the umbrella of disability. It's also important to consider major health conditions that could significantly impair the way someone is engaging with the environment. So things like diabetes, multiple sclerosis, cancer, Ehlers-Danlos, all of those things are considered when we think about how we're creating inclusive and accessible environments for people with disabilities. The Centers for Disease Control currently estimate that one in four persons in the US has a disability. And it's important to realize that many of these disabilities may not be visible or apparent. Now, why this is important to consider is because if we are not thinking about 
the full spectrum of our community, it's possible that we are potentially leaving out 25% of the community from your event simply by not thinking about the inclusion of individuals with disabilities at your festival or event. It's also important to remember that disability is the only group with open enrollment, and it's something that can be joined anytime, and that can be either a temporary or a permanent membership. Any of you who have ever experienced having a broken limb and having to suddenly wear a cast or a brace, perhaps you were using a walker or a cane, know that almost immediately the way in which you were navigating and engaging with your environment shifted drastically. So that's something to also keep in mind as we think about the creation of a disability uh, friendly environment and what that means and who that actually welcomes from our communities. So the fact that you are listening to this webinar today probably means that you have a pretty good sense of why accessibility and inclusion is important for your event and for your organization. However, occasionally we need to have information to provide to other people that may need to understand why this is important and why accessibility and inclusion. So just some quick talking points. Uh, first, it is the law, which is absolutely the wrong motivation, but it is important to recognize that under the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990, it is legally required that uh, your event is accessible and inclusive. Depending on the structure of your event, you could fall under several different titles of the Americans with Disabilities Act, including places of a pu public accommodation, which is Title III, or state local government programs, which is Title Number Two. And it's important to just recognize that your own state guidelines might actually uh, differ and be more stringent than the ADA, so it's always good to check into that as well. But we are not doing this because it is necessarily the law. We're really doing it because it's morally and ethically the right thing to do. Accessibility and inclusion is a social justice issue. It is a human and civil rights issue, and it is necessary as we move towards a society that welcomes and includes everybody. Now, the interesting thing is that accessibility and inclusion also can translate to good economics. So discretionary income is part of everyone's life, including individuals with disabilities. There are some studies that show that uh, working age individuals with disabilities have as much as $21 billion combined of discretionary income. And that's income that you really want to see at your event. It's also important to remember that persons with disabilities, just like everyone else, often attend events with other people, friends, family members, children, and all of that comes with added attendance and added income and econ economy that will come to your event. Now, two of my favorite reasons to really focus on accessibility and inclusion are one, linking to the overall mission, vision, and goals for your organization and your festival. Uh, most festivals are a celebration and a sharing of community. And again, as we think about who is included in that community, we want to make sure that that 25% that we talked about, the one in four, is included as we think about the community that we are celebrating. And at the end of the day, accessibility and inclusion is simply great customer service, making sure that everyone can be welcome to your site, valued for their authentic self, and feel welcome is absolutely the best goal that you can create as you create your festival environment. So one of the things that's useful when we think about framing accessibility is to think about what's called the social model of disability. Some of you might be aware that um, there are many historical models of disability, and it's how society has framed disability, talked about disability, and thought about the disability community for many, many years. Many of these models um, result in a shift of power, where individuals without disabilities are seen as having more clout in the community. Sometimes it's seen that individuals with disabilities need to be somehow fixed or othered or taken care of as a charity or a pity case. And this can really impact how we think about the disability community as a whole. So the social model of disability really thinks about things very differently. It was written by Leonard J. Davis, and it focuses on three major concepts. The first is the idea of impairment, that an individual 
who might move differently, communicate differently, process differently, has an impairment that is a natural part of their life and the way in which they go through their everyday experience. And disability is really what happens when there is an exclusion that happens as a result of the impairment based on the way that the environment is constructed. And really what that says is it's the environment that is actually causing the disability. Leonard Davis also talks about the concept of normalcy, the idea that there is not one normal that we are all striving for, but that we each have our own normal that is inherent to us and is the way in which we live our lives and engage every day. Now, the great thing about this model is that it actually locates disability in societal infrastructures instead of the individual. Disability is actually a result of the way environment is constructed. You can see at the bottom of the slide here, just an easy equation, if you will, to remember this, that impairment plus environment equals disability. And when we talk about environment here, again, we're not just talking about physical environment, but we're talking about the procedural environment and the attitudinal environment and how that really causes someone to feel disabled in a moment based on how they are uh, being received and engaged in that community. So why this is important is that obviously the way disability is framed can impact understanding and language. It can impact the way environments and programming is designed. It can even impact the way educational approaches are designed and expectations for participation, which can mean everything from whether or not someone can participate in an event and be successful, but also even whether someone would be interested in an event. All of that can depend on the way in which disability is being framed and through what model. So when we design with the social model in mind, we automatically assume that visitors will navigate, communicate, process, and engage in a variety of different ways. And the last thing I wanna talk about here is the model of accommodation versus the model of accessibility. A lot of times uh, we, we encounter the model of accommodation, which usually means that a person with a disability has to do extra work, take extra time, take extra steps in order to make sure that they will be welcomed and supported in an, at an environment or at an event or in a place of recreation. So often in the accommodation model, a person with a disability is required to ask for a service and sometimes even explain what that service might be. For example, explaining why they might need ASL interpretation or why they might need a large print program. As you can see, there's a possible invasion of privacy that can happen here that maybe doesn't happen for other patrons or visitors to an event. And the overall feeling here is that I'm special simply because I'm different. And that at the end of the day, things are out of the ordinary, not the norm, and it's extra work. And often it's, well, we're excited to do that for you and we're happy to do that for you, but it is extra work and it's not what we usually do, but we'll do it because you're special. Now, as you can imagine, this can actually put the person with a disability feeling again in that othering situation that we talked of before. So again, if we think about a model instead of accessibility, the idea that there is already a welcome extended through messaging, through the way in which environment is structured, and that the message is you've already considered me and the fact that I would come to your event. I'm special simply because I'm your customer. And at the end of the day, this is not extra work, this is business as usual. And that's really what we wanna think about as we think about creating models of accessibility and weaving that deeply into the fabric as we think about design and implementation. So there are always some general considerations to take into account when thinking about accessibility and inclusion, particularly in a cultural arts environment. Obviously first thinking about the physical space, the layout of the environment, and internal infrastructures of both the building and the programming. Thinking about policies and procedures that are in place and thinking about whether the way in which those policies and procedures are structured unintentionally excludes an individual with a disability for any reason. Thinking about how staff is connected to the mission and vision of accessibility 
making sure staff members feel an ownership and understanding of how the work they do directly impacts the mission and vision of accessibility as a whole throughout an organization or an event. And really empowering the staff to have the strategies and resources at their fingertips so that they can be part of the welcome and support of anyone who comes uh, within contact with the organization or the event. Communication, marketing, and messaging is one of the most important parts of accessibility. Making sure that you are not just putting things in place and creating an accessible and inclusive environment, but that you are further communicating that to the community and making sure they are aware that the event or the organization is accessible and inclusive. Disability community involvement and outreach is also vitally, vitally important. There is a saying, nothing for us without us, and it's very, very true. You want to make sure that the disability community is involved from the very beginning, as you begin planning, as you begin thinking about the way in which you will celebrate and lift up this community, making sure that all the voices in the community are a part of that conversation. Of course, designing the programming and the intended experience of the event is also something to always think about. And this last one is thinking about disability representation within art and programming. This is something that's really beginning to be explored within the field of accessibility and inclusion, particularly as we have more conversations in our society around representation, and really thinking about how, as you represent and celebrate different communities, you are making sure that everyone in that community is lifted up and celebrated equally. Again, including that 25% of the community who may identify with the disability population. So along with general considerations for accessibility come some challenges that are very specific to a festival environment. And I'm sure that all of these might look very familiar to you. So things like the fact that construction is often temporary, um, that there is often a fluidity of space, a fluidity of boundaries. Um, often you are dropped down into the middle of an outdoor space, which is actually larger than the perimeter of your festival, so you're having to navigate that as well. Sometimes there can be faced, if your festival has both ticketed and unticketed events, how you balance that and make sure that um, accessibility is provided in both of those way, in both of those areas and in the ways that someone would navigate between those two areas. Balancing simultaneous accessibility needs is always a challenge. You're making sure that you are trying to provide welcome and inclusion for a wide range of individuals with a wide range of styles of processing and engagement, and so thinking through that can also be an additional challenge. One of the things about festivals is that there is an idea of unexpected discovery. Often festival designers, festival uh, curators, festival committees often think about the idea that uh, guests and visitors will simply happen upon an event or an experience, almost like a pop-up. And that's a really exciting thing from an artistic standpoint. However, it does obviously present some challenges when thinking about how to provide equity of accessibility in that event to communication, to uh, the way in which you navigate an experience like that. Festival is about collaboration, of course, so there's often multiple cooperating partners, organizations, and individuals that you need to make sure are all sort of together as you move forward and think about accessibility. There's often schedule changes, which are just inherent in a traditional festival experience, and also the timeline and length of the event. Uh, some of you might be working in festival environments where there are multiple days of the festival and it goes on for an extended period of time, perhaps even weeks. Um, some of you might be working on a festival that is just simply one day or even a half day. And also thinking about how the timeline of preparation leads up to that as well. Of course, Mother Nature is something that we always need to think about. Um, she often has plans that are different from the ones that we have made. And so that's also something we need to think about as we think about a festival environment. And of course, the unexpected, which probably encompasses all of the things that are not on this list, but may be very specific to your festival environment. 
So we take all this into account and we think about how we begin to create an accessible festival. Well, the first thing to do is to really think about it both architecturally and programmatically. You want to make sure that you're not creating and designing a festival and then all of a sudden trying to add on accessibility at the end. That you're really thinking about how to incorporate the principles of universal and inclusive design just from the very beginning. And that really the goal here is that accessibility and inclusion is not seen as special, it's not seen as extra work, but eventually it's simply seen as the way that you do things and the way that your festival operates. And it does take time to get to that level of, uh, of having this philosophy woven more deeply into the fabric of the organization, but it is possible. So the next thing is to really, again, just assume that visitors will be navigating, communicating, processing, and engaging with your festival site in a variety of ways. And so when we think about how to really make that a reality, there's really four different areas to focus on. The first is the design and build of the actual space, the design of the engagement experience, the accessibility services that you might offer, and the invitation to the community to participate. So let's begin by thinking about the design and build of space. So the first thing you're going to want to consider is just how people will get to your festival site. What are the pathways of travel that they will be using to access your site? Is your site in a more rural setting or is your site in the middle of a city or a town? So you're thinking about the pathways that you create, but also the pathways that might be in place just by the very nature of where your festival is located. And make sure that you have an awareness of the surrounding space and how that is contributing to how someone might access your festival site. You know, oftentimes, particularly in urban environments, there are barriers and barricades that are, are placed to protect the perimeter of the festival. And obviously, those are there for safety and security and are very important. But it's really important to think about if the creation of those barriers and those blockades are then making it impossible for an individual with a disability to easily navigate to your space. And so it takes some collaboration, but also thinking about that, those issues as well. And that's where the idea of drop-off and pick-up locations can be very, very important. So making sure that there are areas where uh, an individual who needs to be dropped off closer to the site can be, be dropped off in a way that is safe and has access to things like curb cuts and an easy entrance into the site. Now, what that means is that sometimes you need to, again, collaborate with local law enforcement. Again, often vehicles are kept away from the perimeter of a site, but is there a way that you can create a special space where there is a drop-off and pick-up location? Thinking about parking, whether or not you are creating parking as part of the design of your site map and your festival footprint, or whether you are using existing parking and just being aware of where accessible parking exists and what the travel is from that parking space to your actual festival entrance. So then as we think about spaces and structures, there's a couple things we want to think about. Obviously, the terrain, some of which of it is given to us and some which we might create ourselves. Thinking about whether your festival uses temporary built environments or if your festival is using existing venues or a combination of the two. If you are using existing venues, it's really important to make sure that those venues are accessible physically and have the things that are needed to be in place in order to provide accessibility and inclusion for all your guests. So thinking about entrance and approach um, to any festival structure. So generally, an entrance, you want to think about something that's at least 32 inches to 36 inches wide. Um, personally, I would always err on the side of the larger entrance um, just to make sure that you're providing plenty of space. And it's really important to think of how is there a direct clean approach if you have, for instance, a tent with an activity happening in inside. But then once inside that space, what does an individual need to navigate in order to 
move through the space. Uh, sometimes people get into a space and it's a, it's a free and open uh, entrance, but then it's dealing with um, tables and exhibit pieces and things that need to navigate. So just taking, a, taking an eye at all of that as you design the space. So making sure that it is free of obstacles, both things that you are building and obstacles that may be acquired because you know, your tent is right next to a giant light pole or there's a fire hydrant right near the entrance of the exhibit. So keeping that in mind as well. Ramps are sometimes used to get into spaces, particularly if spaces are at a different height or if you're trying to get across a curb. Um, and ramps are great. It's important to remember um, the one to 12 inch rules. So there is a one inch ri rise for every 12 inches of run. So you need to make sure that your ramp is of a, uh, a one to 12 ratio as you construct it. And it should be a sturdy material. And I encourage you to really look at the regulations and some of the guidelines and resources at the end of this webinar. A lot of times people will, quite frankly, just put a piece of large plywood down. And that is actually not a safe experience for an individual who is using, for example, a wheelchair. It also is actually putting you in a position of great liability. So it's important to make sure that your ramp is constructed with sturdy, appropriate materials that it has that 1 to 12 uh, ratio in its construction, and that there are edge guards and railings, particularly if it's a longer ramp that is leading to um, a space. Also, a lot of times festivals bring with it an entire sort of instant power grid, if you will. So a lot of times there's cabling around from lighting instruments, from sound equipment. Um, making sure that there is cable ramp across all of those uh, all of those areas, which of course is probably um, just in the way that you do things generally, and making sure that that is safe. But it's important to realize that traditional cable ramp actually does not create accessibility for someone using a wheelchair. There is specific cable ramp that needs to be used. So just make sure, quite frankly, if you're using an electrics company or a sound company, they should be aware of these things, but just keeping that on the radar as well. The last thing you want to think about is just making sure that your space is cane detectable. So for example, um, one example is a lot of tents and temporary structures tend to use ballast in one place and then a guy wire that's leading up to the tension of the top of the tent, which is great, but you want to make sure that that is somehow detectable because a lot of times what can happen is that someone can actually encounter that guy wire before they're encountering the ballast with their cane. So again, just thinking through that as you create safe environments. Now thinking about performance and presentation spaces, again, you want to think about how people will access the venue. What is the path of travel to arrive to the venue? And then you want to think about different viewing and seating areas. Sometimes people might not realize why an individual with a disability may need a specific seating area within a presentation space, particularly if it is designed to be more fluid and people are sort of coming and going. But the thing about it is that there's many reasons why a specific designated space might be beneficial. So if someone has a mobility impairment or is a wheelchair user, having a space that has specific flooring and specific stanchioning up so that it is known as a safe place where they can park their wheelchair safely um, and watch the show. The other thing to recognize is that if someone is a chair user and everyone is standing up watching a concert, what they are seeing is really the back of everyone. They're not able to have visual access to the stage. So keeping that in mind as well. Generally, when you're creating seating areas, if you have just traditional theater seating with chairs or benches, just keeping in mind that a wheelchair space would be about 30 inches wide and 48 inches deep. And then also thinking about companion seating, you want to make sure that there is an option for an individual with disabilities to have someone with them um, who may not use a wheelchair but still would like to sit with them during uh, a performance or a presentation. Also just keeping in mind individuals who are blind or low vision or deaf or hard of hearing might also want to be closer to a performance stage or a presentation space. 
So thinking about, again, if these spaces are temporary or fluid, um, you might find the need to put down a certain kind of flooring, for example, um, armor deck or something that is a flooring that can go on top of your grass, particularly if it's a muddy area, um, just something that provides a nice, safe, uh, and smooth space. It's important to think about rest and break areas. This is something that actually often gets left off the radar, but often we design festival experiences with the idea that everyone will simply be moving and standing and kind of moving from place to place um, throughout the festival. That's great, but unfortunately there are some people who don't have the stamina or have muscle weakness and really need to have those moments where they can sit and those spaces where they can take a rest. So just thinking about as you design your general festival site, can you think through how you can provide some seating areas or can you take advantage of seating of areas that might already exist within your space? If you're in an urban area, can you work the park benches that are there into your general festival site map? Thinking about concessions and dining areas, the traffic flow, the purchase point access, um, is there seating for individuals once they've purchased food or once they've, they've purchased drink that they can go and sit and actually enjoy it? As you think about restroom facilities, recognizing that if you have portable toilets on site, that at least 5% of those portable toilets must be accessible units. Um, if you're using uh, uh, restroom facilities in buildings, in public buildings, definitely be aware of where there are accessible toilets and where those are located so that you can message that information clearly to the disability community. However, if you have portable toilets at all, you must make sure that 5% of those at least are accessible units. And the last is shelter from the weather. A lot of times we are holding festivals at times when it is very, very hot or very, very cold. And you wanna make sure that you have a space where people can take shelter if needed. Um, it's also really great to also have drinking water available. So that's also something to think about in those shelter spaces. So this next slide actually shows two different pictures of some inclusive design and construction that was put in place with um, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. So on the left, you see a walkway that is actually created uh, sort of with an artistic wooden frame that sort of alternates as you walk down the walkway. And if you look at the picture, what you'll notice is there are actually steps on the right to access into that walkway bridge. But what our operations team did was actually create a ramp, again, using that one to 12 rule that extended out from the walkway down into the grass and provided a straight online approach into the walkway. Uh, you'll notice there's a metal strip um, between the end of the wood ramp and the grass. That was because when the ramp was originally put in, we realized that there was actually a lip that was not really navigable, particularly if you had a motorized wheelchair, just that small little lip we were worried would actually cause someone to potentially flip. And we didn't want that, so we created this um, transition piece using a piece of metal that came down. You'll note that on the left of this ramp, we have put in a handrail. However, if you look closely, you'll notice on the right in this particular picture, there's actually not an edge guard on the other side. This is something that was actually work in progress. This ramp was actually, uh, this is a picture from several years ago. And I am happy to say that as time has gone on, we have improved this ramp every year and there is actually an edge guard on the right hand side now. On the right is an example of a concession stand from the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. This was actually a concession stand that was used to uh, purchase um, beer. We had, a, uh, we had several different brewers who came in and offered different uh, beers for tasting and purchase as part of the festival. And you can see we positioned it in a place where it was very close to a curb cut. It was very accessible. There was some really open sidewalk leading up to it. So it was a very direct uh, approach. And if you notice, there are two levels of counter heights. And that was very specific in the design to make sure that there were different um, levels of purchase point. 
And actually, because of the way this experience was designed, a decision was made, and we spoke with all the concessionaires at this site to make sure that any purchase was happening for anyone at the lower uh, counter heights. And then if there was additional conversation that was happening, that that was happening at the higher, at the higher um, counter height. Um, we also talked very um, in depth with our concessionaires at this site to make sure that we had a system in place um, so that if someone was at a purchase point and perhaps was using a mobility device that staff would actually assist in making sure that there was a delivery of the drinks in a way so they wouldn't have to navigate the stanchions or navigate the line while also trying to balance drinks and use a mobility device. So there were several factors that came into this as we designed this space. So now we want to move to the second area of focus, which is the engagement experience. And really, this begins by, in the planning, thinking about intention. What is the intended experience for visitors to have? And then thinking about in what ways do there need to be supports in place to make sure that everyone can have that equal, equitable, intended experience. So a lot of times, areas of engagement happen in booths, um, tents, uh, farmer's market style sort of setups, or activity areas. So again, very similarly to what we were talking about just in the design and build of our general structures, making sure there is clear approach, uh, making sure that there is clear entrance into these tents, and that again, there is clear internal navigation and uh, a way to maneuver within the space. Particularly in activity areas, there tend to be a lot of chairs and tables. So making sure that some of those tables have designated areas where an individual using a wheelchair can simply roll up and doesn't necessarily need to navigate with a chair or anything like that. Thinking about heights of counters and tables is really important. Whether or not these are activity tables and places where individuals are engaging directly, or whether it's simply a display area, you want to make sure that the height is between 36 to 39 inches. Once you get above 38 inches, it starts to get pretty high, particularly if you are a chair user. So I encourage you to think about keeping those, those uh, heights of counters a little lower. And again, thinking about the design of the display, and sometimes this is working directly with your artisans or your participants or the organizations who are coming to showcase at your festival, making sure that it's just not um, a series of materials laid flat on the table, but are there ways to vary the display so that there are both vertical and horizontal um, display options within the table. So if there is an art project, making sure that there are a variety of materials available to accommodate individuals who might have different and varied ways of motor skills as they uh, do artwork or do anything that is using fine motor skills. So for instance, uh, a really simple example is if you have markers, making sure that you have both skinny markers and chubbier markers and that that's available for everyone so that everyone can use things that they need to create the piece that you're asking them to create. If there is an art project, providing sample steps of the process is a great way to communicate uh, what needs to happen at each stage, but also gives folks a visual reference of what to work towards. And that can be particularly helpful for individuals who might uh, communicate non-verbally or individuals who might have autism or other sensory processing issues that might impact sequencing or uh, things of that nature. Making sure there are communication options, making sure there are a variety of ways that someone can communicate with the artisans and with uh, anyone who's demonstrating. So visuals are always great if there are, uh, if a visitor is being asked to make certain choices, are there ways that those can be displayed visually on a card as well as verbally expressed? Also thinking about um, what's the tactile engagement? If someone is blind or low vision, are there ways that they can engage and explore any artwork that's being displayed uh, in a tactile way? 
A lot of times festivals do have larger objects, uh, cars, airplanes, things that might be on display. Um, it's really important to realize that not everyone will be able to access the interior of, this, uh, of these objects in the same way. So one way to address this is obviously to, you can create a simple video tour of what the inside of, um, for instance, a car or a plane might look like, and then have that available on an iPad so that someone can actually watch that and get a sense of what going up into that object might be if they are unable to do so for whatever reason. Uh, also, sometimes festivals uh, have trailers that have different activities happening inside them. I usually try to encourage people to steer away from that. It's really hard to make a trailer accessible, even if you can get a lift that gets you up to the level of the trailer. Once inside the trailer, it can be really difficult to navigate. So again, if there are activities happening in that trailer, is there a way to showcase them in some way through a video or through some sort of representation, tactile of what's happening, or even bringing the activity out of the trailer and onto the area that's just outside so that everyone has the ability to engage and see what's happening. So another area to think about in engagement is obviously retail and concessions. We talked a little bit about concessions before, but again, same idea here. You want to make sure it's approachable. You want to make sure there's good line management and flow. If there are menus or price lists, making sure they are readable, but also making sure there are um, alternative formats available. So things like having things in large print, having things um, available in Braille. Um, and really, those can be provided in a variety of different ways. Um, often there are local organizations uh, who can uh, who serve the blind or low vision community who might be willing to work with you to provide Braille menus. If you can provide them the menus ahead of time, they might be able to produce a couple so that those can be on hand for your concessionaires. Uh, again, displays high and low. Concessions is always tricky if it is, for instance, if you're using food trucks, those can be actually really hard to be accessible. So just making sure there is a plan in place for customer interaction. Anyone who is unable to necessarily reach the top of the, uh, of the food truck or the counter there and thinking about that checkout process. Um, how will you address varied uh, communication styles? Um, what does the purchase point look like and what does the delivery of product look like and how might you be able to employ staff or volunteers in order to assist with that process. So as we think about these first two areas of consideration, the design and build of our site and also the engagement experience, this is when it's really important to think about having a site survey specifically for accessibility. And it's a great way to utilize user experts from the disability community who offer multiple perspectives. Um, the picture that is on this slide is actually a member of the blind low vision community from Washington DC who was part of our site survey at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. She's actually uh, standing on the walkway that uh, we showcased a little earlier in an earlier slide. And she's actually noticing that um, this was uh, before, this, before the festival opened that uh, there is a uh, beam that comes up in an artistic way but is actually not cane detectable so she was helping us to understand that we had to do something in order to make this area cane detectable so that someone wouldn't come along and hit their head before their cane discovered this brace. So things like that are great because it's great to have multiple perspectives to actually catch these types of things. So you want to consider the timeline. When is the best time to do a survey for accessibility? It should be as close to uh, when the festival site is actually complete and constructed, but also taking into account that you want to have some time if you need to make any adjustments. So really just spending some time where you have perhaps someone with a mobility impairment, someone from the blind to low vision community, um, perhaps even someone from the autism community, and you can kind of move through the site together, explain what is supposed to happen in each space, and get some feedback about how to create um, a really accessible and inclusive experience. And then from that, you wanna create a triage list, 
And then think about ongoing adjustments that you will make. If you have the luxury of a festival that is longer in length, um, perhaps anywhere from three days to 10 days, that's great because you continue to improve the experience and continue to make adjustments as you see the way in which the public is interacting with the space. Um, so you can make a list of current adjustments and also keep in mind how this can be applied to future design of festival sites moving forward in the years to come. So the next area to focus on is what accessibility services will be provided on the festival site. Now the first thing I want to talk about is assistive listening systems. For those of you who might not know, assistive listening just simply amplifies the sound for someone who might be hard of hearing and need a little boost in hearing the specifics of what is happening in a performance space or a presentation space. Any program area on your festival site that has amplified sound for presentation, such as a performance stage, um, a panel discussion, any program area like that really needs to have amplified sound in place. Now choosing an assistive listening type, system type can really depend. There are several different system types, including FM, infrared, there's loop systems, and really the system that is the best fit for your festival will depend on the setting, the space, and sometimes the preference of your own community. So it's really important to connect with a sound company who can provide you some guidance based on the area that you have and what you're trying to achieve and they can recommend the best systems. Another great way to think about this is to actually uh, speak with the cultural arts organizations within your community. Your local theater, your local symphony orchestra probably already have assistive listening systems in place. So to talk to them about what they have found that works and doesn't work, um, if you're really lucky, some of them might actually have a portable system that can be used in your space temporarily that you can either loan or rent during the time of your festival. You want to make sure that you have a system in place so that visitors to the festival site can acquire a receiver uh, for amplified listening. So whatever that is, whether or not they're receiving uh, that at the actual performance space or at an information table, just making sure that there's a clear system of in place for ac acquiring that, signing it out, having a contact information, all of that. It's also really important that you collaborate with your on-site sound and tech support for the festival. To be quite honest, assistive listening systems are actually pretty simple and easy to set up, but they do require some interface with um, sound boards, and so you want to make sure that just you and your tech team are working closely together and having that on the radar as you prep and load in for the festival. The next thing to think about is the idea of mobility supports. Now, most individuals who require a mobility device will probably bring one with them to the site, but it is often really a great customer service plus if you can provide a couple extra assistive devices in case someone who uh, might uh, be faced with low stamina or muscle weakness or just not have really thought about the heat or the length of time they will be walking or standing. Um, having some wheelchairs on site can be great or some cane chairs. Usually those can be uh, rented for uh, quite inexpensively from a local medical supply uh, a provider. And again, you want to have a clear system for acquisition and loan. Uh, usually with something like a mobility device, you want to make sure that you're uh, getting some sort of collateral, usually a license or uh, something that you can have and keep in a lockbox in a central location and then provide that mobility device to the individual and they return it at the end of the day. Uh, it's also important to think about transport options. If you are a larger festival and have golf carts or other um, vehicles that are used to transport visitors between locations, make sure that one of those uh, has an accessible option. If there's a shuttle being used uh, from the parking uh, venue to get to your festival site, make sure that one of those shuttles at least is wheelchair accessible. Um, if you're using golf carts, um, there are ways to uh, rent a golf cart that is wheelchair accessible. So just if you are providing transportation as part of the festival experience, make sure that you are taking into account that some of those uh, transportation options are accessible. 
So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, vendors who are providing communication access either to um, oral communication or visual communication that is happening. So the first is American Sign Language Interpretation, which is generally a trained uh, ASL interpreter who is taking the spoken language and interpreting it into the language of American Sign Language. The second thing that you might see is captioning or real-time uh, transcription services happening. That's generally when someone is actually listening to, for example, a panel presentation. They're actually typing verbatim what is being said, and then those words are displayed on either an LED screen or a plasma TV or in some way uh, so that it, those words are visible to an audience. And then audio description is uh, a service that allows those who are blind or low vision to have access to visual information through description. So a trained describer would uh, be actually uh, describing visual elements of an experience to a visitor who is blind or low vision, so they're getting all the visual information that somebody else might be getting using their eyes. So great examples, um, dance performances, circus, magic shows, um, animal exhibitions, those types of things would be great for an audio described experience. So when you're offering these services, you're going to want to make sure there's a clear schedule of when those services are being provided. And if possible, you want to make sure that there's an added on-demand option, um, just so that uh, if someone is really looking to attend something that is not on your schedule, that they might have the option to have a float ASL interpreter come with them. It's also great to have a float ASL interpreter to address things, uh, questions that might come up at an information booth or any emergencies that might come up in a medical tent. So as you think about uh, placement for these accessibility uh, vendors, particularly uh, in a performance space, you want to think about their location, um, making sure they have appropriate light or appropriate sound feed if it's someone like a captioner. Um, you want to think about the traffic flow, making sure that traffic is not going to, uh, the flow of traffic is not going to impede uh, the communication of service between the provider and the individual who is using that service. And also just thinking about the elements. So if you have an interpreter on stage, making sure if everyone is covered that your interpreter is also covered, things like that. Any prep materials you can provide to these service providers will be welcomed and appreciated and will make the service provision even that much better. So set lists from artists, um, lyrics, if they can provide those to you, but otherwise even just a list of songs that you can provide to the interpreter so that they can do some research ahead of time and get to know that artist. Um, any curated content that's happening, if there are panel discussions happening, provision of names that will be used or different topics that will be discussed, that's always very helpful as well. It's always good to think about cultural representation. So if you have a specific culture that's being represented um, or uh, within your festival to make sure that you're letting service providers know that so that they can provide interpreters um, that will match that experience. And also, of course, always updating and communicating any schedule changes. Changes are very inherent in a festival environment, but making sure that there's a way to communicate um, if an interpreted event or an audio described event has been canceled or moved to a different time. Another thing to think about is alternative format materials. Festivals tend to have multiple text entry points. There's signs, there's schedules, there's things at the concessions booth, there's things at the information table. So really, how can there be a provision of alternative formats of this material for individuals who are blind or low vision? So providing large print, providing braille, providing tactile maps, um, again, this is where partnering with your local disability community, uh, partnering with organizations within your state or county that serve the blind low vision community and might be able to work with you to uh, provide these services or, uh, or might even be able to donate some of the materials um, so that you can provide uh, equitable access to the experience. 
technology is uh, really wonderful. And so thinking about different ways and creative ways that you might be able to provide access, perhaps providing audio schedules. Um, if you have QR codes um, on your signs that have a lot of text and someone can scan that and then hear someone speaking the text on the sign, that's a really creative way to approach that issue as well. So there are some additional service considerations to take into account. These are sort of uh, cherries on the sundae, but always things to think about as you look at how you can make things even better as you move through time. So device charging stations, and I am not talking about cell phones, but I'm talking more about if someone needs to charge a communication device, um, if someone has a motorized scooter and their battery has run low, which can often happen if they're in extreme heat or extreme cold. Do you have a system in place? It doesn't even have to be publicly um, a system that's necessarily advertised to the public, but just that your staff is aware of what the options are if someone were to come to you and say, oh, my scooter has lost power and I need to find a place where I can plug in and recharge my scooter. Um, so just to be aware of that and keep that on the radar. Having areas for service dogs to be able to get both water and a, a relief area is really important. So keeping that in mind as well. Uh, family and companion care restrooms which if you are using uh, portable toilets probably is not an option, but again, if you are using a combination of uh, public space within brick and mortar buildings, being aware of where family and companion care restrooms are located, and then again, putting that within your accessibility materials and messaging so that people know if they need to find those types of spaces where they can do so. Thinking about sensory supports is really important. A festival can often be overwhelming from every sensorial input. So just really thinking about, are there ways you can support individuals who might be coming to the site and have particular hyper or hyposensitivity to different sensory inputs? So um, if you can create a sensory guide that just is a brief one pager that talks about where the areas of um, high sensory input might be um, either in terms of sound or smell or, uh, or movement. And then areas that are more quiet and making sure that that's outlined as well. Or even creating designated quiet areas or quiet spaces within your festival where someone can go and just kind of decompress if they need to or be able to kind of shut out sensory stimulus if needed. Specialized programs are a great way to welcome uh, members of the disability community. Uh, for example, uh, you might have uh, your festival open a little earlier one morning and welcome individuals with autism or children with autism and their families just so that it's a controlled and more quiet environment and one that's a little less chaotic. Um, you might have a specialized touch tour for the blind or low vision community who can really explore the site uh, and have some real tactile engagement with some of the items on site. And again, specialized programs are not in lieu of creating an accessible and inclusive festival. They are simply an extra added step and a way to really provide a, uh, a welcome and an entry gate into the general festival experience. It's always important to keep in mind that visitors are not the only individuals who might need accessibility. Your artists and participants and performers may need accessibility, so making sure if you are doing any survey of that information beforehand and making sure that individuals know that you are willing to work with them to provide what they need, um, but also keeping that in mind as well as you think about access to performance stages and those kinds of things. I've also put emergency protocols and preparation on here. Um, I know that many festivals really take this very seriously and have a lot of conversation around what uh, emergency protocols will be if um, the unexpected uh, were to occur. It's really important that persons with disabilities are um, included as you think through the planning of if you would need to quickly evacuate or shelter in place. Um, often persons with disabilities are consistently left out of the plans and uh, protocols for emergency planning. So just making sure that is on your radar 
your local fire and police station probably can help you address this. So definitely reach out to them. And also disability advocacy groups within town can help you to make sure that everyone is included and that your entire community is included should you ever have to enact an emergency protocol. So this last area of consideration that we want to talk about is this area of an in invitation, how we are making sure that the community knows that they are welcome to come to our festival and our event. And the thing that's most important, I believe, is to make invitation intentional. A lot of times um, I hear organizations and events say, well, of course, anyone is welcome. And the reality is that Sometimes if you are not extending intentional invitation to the disability community, the assumption is that your event will simply not be accessible. And quite frankly, that's because of bad experiences in the past. So if you are uh, making accessibility and inclusion a priority, you want to make sure that it is in the messaging and materials and every way that you are communicating about your festival or event, you are including the fact that it is accessible and an inclusive and really make sure you're outlining how it's accessible and inclusive, that you've thought about parking or if you're providing specific services or what things will be in place. Make sure that you're messaging that because that, that, sends, um, that sends really a clear, uh, a, a clear beacon to the disability community that you have considered that they will be a part of this celebration and this sharing of community. You want to make sure to include uh, disability access symbols and icons for accessibility. These are e really easy to access. Um, the Graphic Artists Guild has created uh, a free resource which has all of these icons available and downloadable. But you can also find them from any local graphic designer. If you're working with a graphic designer, they probably already have these icons. But just make sure that for example, if you if you know that there will be wheelchair accessibility in the space, that you are putting that wheelchair icon. If you will have interpreters on site, that you have the interpreter icon so that people know. You want to reach out to listservs and community contacts. And again, this is part of including the disability community early on, making sure that they are involved and that they are aware and can help you spread the word uh, that everyone is welcome at your event. So on site, you want to continue that messaging uh, because you're providing information, but you're also sharing with the greater community of your festival that accessibility and inclusion is an organizational and, a, and value, and it is important to this event. So creating a central information point for accessibility services uh, where you can provide schedules, materials, uh, that's a place where you can have uh, wheelchair loans if you need it, those kinds of things. And also increase signage and visibility. And the next slide, there's some examples of that on-site invitation and visibility. So there's three photos on this slide, and in the upper left-hand corner, there's an actual very large sign, very uh, professionally created. Uh, this is from the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. There's a large map of the entire festival site, which takes up about five city blocks uh, on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And on the left is actually a, uh, a column that actually outlines accessibility services. So those accessibility icons are there with detailed descriptions of what's available. This is a very large sign that's located in the middle of the National Mall, so any public walking by will see information about the festival. Now, on the right-hand side of the slide, there is a more sort of uh, simple version of accessibility uh, invitation and visibility in that it's actually a schedule board for a specific space. It's actually a dry erase board, so you can see that written the festival staff has written the time and title of each event. And then uh, what's happened is there has been the addition of very small icons that indicate different accessibility services that might be available. Uh, you can see that at 2 p.m. there was an event that was ASL interpreted, and the ASL icon of the interpreted sign was actually just stuck up. These were just simple plas uh, squares of cardboard with the, with the graphic on it that were then laminated and could be removed and stuck on to that dry erase board every day. That's really one way to think about um, that 
you know, communication does not necessarily need to be super fancy. It just needs to be clear and consistent. So there are different ways to approach communication depending on what the structure of your festival site is, but also the budget you have and how you're approaching it. And on the bottom is an example of um, an accessibility information table. There's two smiling volunteers. They're in a white tent, and in front of them is a table that has a variety of accessibility materials and information. And there's a sign that's uh, a blue sign that says accessibility information with the wheelchair icon. So these are just some examples of how communication can uh, provide access to accessibility services, but also just message the fact that this is a really important part of your event and uh, it is a value and of the mission of your organization. So festivals are inherently about collaboration and so I wanted to have a slide um, about working with others because it can often be one of the most challenging parts of making accessibility a successful experience. So first of all, thinking about all the different individuals and agencies that you will intersect with as you collaborate and as you design and plan for the festival. So local and state agencies, um, local and state law enforcement, uh, if, the, if you are working with specific venues, um, different collaborators, vendors that might be on your site, whether they are concessionaires or selling uh, different goods, your fellow staff and colleagues, the volunteers that you bring on site, and the artists and performers that you might have as part of your festival. That's a lot of people, but there are some consistent things that you want to keep in mind. The first is you want to make sure everyone is clear that there is a mission and intention to create an accessible and inclusive environment. So communicating this right at the top, that this is part of what you do, and again, it's not an extra thing, it's simply the way that your festival does business. And framing it that way from the start can be a great step in the right direction. Creating that connection and buy-in, creating that um, idea that accessibility is everyone's job and really you do want everyone who's connected with the festival to be able to share that it is this welcoming and inclusive experience and that the entire community is welcome. And so part of that is providing education and training, uh, particularly for your frontline staff, but also just making sure that everyone is aware of how accessibility is intersecting with their space. If you have performance spaces where there are sound techs or light techs or stage managers, just simply giving them a one sheet that explains what will be happening at their site, if they will have interpreters on their stage, um, if there are assistive listening devices at that site, just making sure that you're able to provide education to everyone. Uh, maybe taking a moment to talk to your concessionaires about how uh, some strategies and resources for that, how they can assist visitors who might be navigating or communicating differently when they approach the concession stand. Recognizing, again, that everybody has a diverse entry point, just as you are on a journey and your organization is on a journey with this work, so is everyone that you're encountering. So keeping that in mind, it is a fluid process, it is ongoing. And really the goal is to empower folks who, so that they will begin creatively brainstorming solutions. Uh, one of the best things I've experienced in a festival that I work with on a regular basis is now often the programmers and curators are coming to me before I have come to them to say, we have this event and or we have this experience and we've been thinking about how to make it accessible. We're thinking about this. What do you think? That's fantastic because what that means is that they have now taken this on as a core value of the work that they are doing. And we will have a conversation about how it happens rather than me simply telling them it has to happen and them feeling like it's another oppressive rule or anything they have to deal with. I'm a big fan of making things personal. So if there are impact stories, if there's feedback, if something wonderful has happened the day before with a family who's visited or an individual who's visited and pointed out accessibility, really finding a way to share that with the entire staff 
and taking a moment so that folks know that this was something and can really take ownership and feel proud that they are part of an organization and part of a festival and event that makes this a core value. So I always uh, tend to offer gratitude to people um, and thank them for being part of the vision and the mission. Even if they feel they aren't directly related, um, they begin to gain a sense of ownership through that. So communication breakdowns do happen. And so this next slide, there's actually um, a picture of two um, very large communication breakdowns. The first one on the left is actually uh, from a festival that I worked on, and I take total responsibility for this. So if you remember in a uh, previous slide, we talked about the concession stand that had um, a variety of different levels of counters. This was actually the same concession structure, but used in a different festival. Um, however, I never explained to the concessionaires what the difference in level of the counters was, and nobody had made the choice to, we had not thought to um, really communicate that to our vendors and concessionaires. So what that means is, as you see in this picture, this lower counter became a great place for a disco light and a stereo speaker and the napkin holder, and all the recycling and compost bins were placed in front of this lower counter. Um, and so that hasn't happened again because we've now realized that that's something we need to communicate directly to our concessionaires because they don't necessarily know what we're thinking when they roll up onto site. Uh, the second picture on this slide I'm actually very proud to say it was not a festival I was working on. However, it is it was a festival uh, not too far away from where I live. And what you see is that there is a bank of portable toilets, including an accessible toilet. Um, but unfortunately, it is dropped right on top of the two accessible parking spaces. And um, the person who shared this uh, picture actually pointed out that these were the only two accessible parking spaces in this outdoor event that was being held by the county. Um, and actually, this picture comes to uh, to us from uh, the Pushy Lawyer, who and she has a wonderful Facebook page where she talks about um, accessibility and inclusion, and I encourage you to check it out. There's a link there on the slide. Um, but what's interesting is I, I did I was kind of shocked that this had happened because I started to think as an accessibility person myself how many communication breakdowns had happened in the process of just planning where these uh, portable toilets were going to go all the way through to the actual delivery. Um, what I learned from some of my friends who are wheelchair users and do utilize accessible parking spaces is that this actually happens more often than it doesn't. So again, here's two examples of communication breakdowns, but just to keep in mind how you can keep everyone involved in the experience so that these types of things don't happen. And then having a plan in place that if something like this does happen, you can go back, correct it, perhaps create a teachable moment so that it doesn't happen again. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this next slide, but it is really important for your frontline staff. Um, and I would say that if you have frontline staff, volunteers, staff, just making sure that you are providing a level of training um, before the event, and if possible, involving first person and user experts um, as part of that training, whether that's through videos, whether that's through actually having members of the disability community involved in this volunteer training. But keeping in mind that really just some basic customer service things, obviously first impressions will set the tone. And when you frame accessibility and inclusion through the customer service lens, you're looking at really all the same things that great customer service offers. You're valuing every visitor. Um, you're asking how you can help and really listening to what the answer is. It's important to offer information and options, but not making the decision. Uh, sometimes people on the front lines, the, uh, the gut reaction is to be overly anxious or overly protective of an individual with a disability. It's really important to remember that an individual with a disability lives with their disability all the time. They are an expert on what that disability is and what they need to be successful in a space. Your frontline staff is an expert on the festival environment, and so together that's a superhero team. So also reminding your frontline staff, not all disabilities are visible or apparent. 
And it's important to remember that communication does not necessarily equal cognition. A lot of times when someone does not co communicate verbally or communicates in a way that seems disfluent or disjointed, um, it's, it's human nature to make an assumption that perhaps that person is not cognitively aware or cognitively present. It's important to always remember that communication does not necessarily equate with cognition. And the most important thing for your frontline staff, as we've been saying before with all your staff and colleagues, is to make sure that they are familiar with the available services. So I've been talking a lot, and you have a lot of information, and how do you get started? So just a reminder, the first thing is to really plan for inclusion. Make it a core value for the event, and that means internal conversations with your planning team and external conversations with the community and with advocacy groups and with organizations that can help you in this endeavor. You want to really map your community. One of the first things you want to do is meet with some disability advocate groups, meet with some members of um, the disability services of your government, and really have a conversation about who is in your community. Um, is there a large blind or low vision population within your community that traditionally does not come to the festival? That's a great place to start because you know you have that potential audience there. On the flip side, if um, there isn't a large blind, low vision population coming to your festival, but you have a large deaf and hard of hearing population that comes to your festival every single year, how can you start by making sure that you are enhancing and improving accessibility for that contingency that's all, for that contingent that's already coming to your festival on a regular basis? You've already earned their loyalty, so you want to make sure that you are supporting their experience as much as possible. Again, thinking about universal and inclusive design, not as an afterthought, but just woven into the fabric of how you do business. Designating an accessibility coordinator, and that can sound really daunting, particularly if you have a smaller staff, and really what this means is designated someone who will be a point person and a liaison, both to the public, but also to your uh, vendors and service providers, and someone who's constantly keeping this on the radar. I understand that with smaller festival staffs, this can be really challenging because everyone is already wearing multiple hats, but thinking about um, are there ways you can utilize volunteers? Uh, can you create an accessibility and inclusion task force made up of members of the disability community and members of your staff or volunteers? Um, is there a, a local college program that specializes in special education or something like that which might have a college student that could serve as an accessibility coordinator perhaps as a practicum or as part of their coursework? So there's some creative ways to think about this as you move forward. Again, involving the disability community, I can't stress this enough, create a task force of user experts and advisors. I know it can be really scary, uh, this idea that you don't want to involve people until you know that things are okay because you're worried that people will be offended or judged. Obviously, you want to just you know, select some advisors who and be very transparent. We are taking a journey. This is something we're working on, and we're looking to you to um, actually work with us. We, we want to know how to do better. So really framing it that way and making sure you're putting um, a, a task force in place. Important thing is to start where you are, set some short and long-term goals, and dream forward. That's the best thing you can do. This next slide is some wise words um, from uh, two of uh, people, colleagues that I have in the field, um, who really just um, show us things to keep in mind. And the first one says, we can't let the fact that we can't do everything be the excuse for not doing anything. And I think that's really important because sometimes it can be easy to get very overwhelmed and think, well, we can't do it all. And you're right, you can't do it all. But thinking about where can you start and then build from there. Um, and the second thing I will just share is a quote from a friend and colleague of mine that said, when people don't plan, people get left out circling back to that idea of making sure that the entire community is involved in this event, which is about community and celebration. 
The next two slides provide some resources. Uh, the planning guide for making temporary events accessible comes from the ADA National Network and is a wonderful resource with lots of details, measurements. Uh, it takes some of the uh, areas that we talked about in this webinar and really delves further and gives some very specific ways to achieve those goals. So definitely check that out. Um, there's another uh, resource from uh, the Great Plains ADA Center, which is accessible temporary events. And then the Guide to Accessible Outdoor Events, this is actually from Ontario, Canada. Um, so the standards will be different than what is necessarily the standards uh, here in the United States. However, it is really good to look at. There are some really great things uh, that just talking philosophically and how you think sort of more inclusively across the whole event. And then there's some more resources. I have recently been very excited by the American Society of Landscape Architects Universal Design Guide. Um, really, uh, ASLA is focusing on permanent environments, but again, they have some great conversation around what it means to create inclusive community space, particularly inclusive community public space. Every year, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts creates and hosts the Leadership Exchange in Arts and Disability Conference. This is a conference that brings together cultural arts administrators from all around the country, from museums and festivals and theaters and symphonies and botanic gardens, and everyone comes together to really talk about what it means to create accessible and inclusive cultural arts environment. It's held annually, and here's a link that gets you to the actual page that will give you information about the conference each year. And the Minnesota Access Alliance, which is in your backyard and provides some great, great resources and great, great programs that explore how to create accessibility, particularly in cultural arts settings. So now it's your turn to reflect and think about what has really resonated within this session. Um, what are you excited about? What changes do you think you can make right away? Just small things that will make a big difference. And then as you begin to look ahead, thinking about the changes you can make to your design and construction, to the intended engagement um, for your visitors, and to the intentional invitation that you're creating to the community. It's also important to think about internal and external resources and your allies in this work both internally within your own organization or festival staff, but also externally within the community as well. So it's important to realize that this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, this is a lot of information, and I understand that it can e you can easily become overwhelmed. That is not the goal. The goal here is to provide strategies. This webinar will continue to be on the uh, Minnesota State Arts Board site so that you can come back to it and check in and revisit some of the slides and strategies, but also recognizing again that accessibility and inclusion is an ongoing journey. It is never done. It is something we are always seeking to improve. So recognize where you are in that journey and embrace the fact that you have taken the time to listen in on this webinar today and that you are going to take the next steps so if you have questions, there are some resources on this last slide. The Arts Board Accessibility Coordinator, who can be contacted at area code 651-539-2666, or by email at msab at arts.state.mn.us. The Arts Board Minnesota Festival Support Program Officer, who can be reached at area code 651 539-2661 or by emailing msab at arts.state.mn.us and the Minnesota Access Alliance, which can be reached at area code 651-539-2689 or by emailing info at mnaccess.org. Thank you so much for taking time to attend this webinar on festival accessibility. All the best as you continue to plan, design, and implement your festival.